Hello, I'm Phoenix City Council Member Carlos Garcia with District 8. We will never replace in-person teaching, but during these trying times, our children still need to continue to learn. The City of Phoenix is proud to partner with both the Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts to bring you Phoenix TV Classroom Study Hall. Youth and education is a priority for Phoenix. That's why the city is bringing you the study hall to your home during this next hour right here on Phoenix TV. Learning should never stop, so get ready for class. Here's the study hall. Fletcher here, second grade teacher in the Osborne School District at Solano Elementary, home of the Tigers. Rawr. The actual sign for Tiger is like this. So now you know two things. So today I have a little tidbit for some tongue twister trivia. That's alliteration. When we repeat lots of sounds that are similar in a row, alliteration. Tongue twisters are all about alliteration. This helps with our listening and the way that we speak, which ultimately helps with our language. Listening, speaking, presenting, reading, writing, these are all things that tie into our English language proficiency standards. That means the way that we speak and our fluidity when we use our words. So, let's try some tongue twisters from our book and our friends in the book, Tongue Twisters to Tangle Your Tongue, illustrated by Becca Cobb. Rebecca Cobb. All right, wow, wow, that's somehow how I feel when I speak. Now, we're not gonna do all these right now. This is just a little, uh, you know, trivia, let's see. So we've done how much wood could a woodchuck chuck? So what about this one? This is one we have not done. It's called, Big black bear. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can say this. All right, here we go. And if I make a mistake, well, that's kind of what a tongue twister does until you get better at it. And then, watch out. The big black bug bit the big black bear, but the big black bear bit the big black bug back. <whistles> Let's try it again. And I'll tap each word. The big black bug bit the big black bear, but the big black bear bit the big black bug back. Now those are words that are pretty much one syllable, and most adults would say that that's easy. So, I want you to go have your most adults say it. And we're gonna say it quickly, right? Here we go. We like a challenge, tricky Mrs. Fletcher. The big black bug bit the big black bear, but the big black bear bit the big black bug back. Now, I think that's something that I should practice. Should we do another one? All right. Okay. Here's one that's not very many words. Just because something doesn't have a lot of words doesn't mean it's not hard. Always remember toy boat. Toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. All right, here we go. Sam's shop stocks short spotted socks. What sounds do you hear, right? Close your eyes, your phonemic awareness. That means the sounds, the smaller sounds that letters make without looking. S, right, here we go. Sam's shop stocks short spotted socks. Sam's shop stocks short spotted socks. Sam's shop stocks short spotted socks. <laughs> so fun. All right, let's try another one. Last one, friends. This one has, here, well, that way it's not confusing. We have, and this is Mrs. Fletcher's personal book. Don't be bending anyone else's books. This book was meant to be bent so that we can use it with our tongue twisting trivia. Just wanted to make sure we understood that. A noisy noise annoys an oyster. So what is this telling us? That something that's noisy, a noise that's noisy, is annoying an oyster. 
Okay. A noisy noise annoys an oyster. A noisy noise annoys an oyster. A noisy noise annoys an oyster. Last time. A noisy noise annoys an oyster. Can you hear it in your head? Can you say it? A noisy noise annoys an oyster. Tongue twisters. Who knew? So fun for me. So fun for you. This is Mrs. Fletcher with your tongue twisting trivia. Helping you work on your language skills one tongue twister at a time. Thanks so much, super tongue twisting friends. I can't wait to talk and listen and speak and read and write with you again soon. I will see you again. Thanks so much. Have a beautiful day. Mrs. Fletcher, signing off. I have a story I would like to share with you, and you tell me what you think. Is it similar to a story you've heard before? What can we think about diversity and inclusion, how we treat other people by what happens in this story? Let's check it out. This is called The Ugly Truckling by David Gordon. Ooh, indigo blue, so pretty. Wow, it kind of looks like Arizona, huh? That's pretty cool. Way out west where the vehicles roam from ranch to ranch. A mother truckling admired her new trucklings. She smiled at their big round wheels, their strong flat beds, and the way their chrome shone brightly under the stars. But one of the trucklings was not like her brothers and sisters. This truckling's wheels were small and narrow. She didn't have a strong flat bed, and her chrome did not shine brightly under the stars. To make matters worse, two strange beams stuck out from the sides of her body. She was an ugly truckling. The next morning, the little trucklings followed their mother carrying rocks and bricks and wood in their little truck beds. But the ugly truckling could barely haul a small bale of hay or pull a log. All the other little trucklings laughed at her. Why do you have three wheels instead of four? Asked one of her brothers. And why do you carry hay on your head? Asked her sister. You'll never be a good truck, said another brother. The ugly truckling was very sad. She was afraid he was right. So late one night, when the sky was black and starless, the ugly truckling sped away. Oh, she's leaving. The next morning, she met a tractor. Good morning, said the ugly truckling. Who are you? I'm a tractor, said the tractor. Am I a tractor too? You're no tractor. Tractors don't have propellers on their noses. Oh, sighed the ugly truckling, and she sped away. Then the ugly truckling met a cow. Good afternoon, said the ugly truckling. Who are you? I'm a cow, said the cow. Am I a cow too? You're no cow. Cows have legs, not wheels. Oh said the ugly truckling, and she sped away a little slower than before. The ugly truckling drove for hours until she reached a pond. There she met a windmill. Good evening, said the ugly truckling, sadly. Who are you? I'm a windmill, said the windmill. Am I a windmill too? You're no windmill. Windmills are tall and have big spokes. Oh, said the ugly truckling, and she slowly started to roll away. Wait, said the windmill. Why are you so sad? I'm not a tractor. I'm not a cow. Not a windmill. And I don't think I'm a truck either. I don't know who I am.
the windmill smiled. I have a feeling that you will know exactly who you are very soon. The ugly chuckling looked at her reflection in the pond. Suddenly, she heard a loud roar overhead and looked up. The windmill was right. She wasn't an ugly chuckling after all. She was a beautiful airplane. And so she flew away with the other airplanes into a sky full of stars. Well, my friends, what do you think about when you hear that story? Do you think about how the other little trucklings treated her? They treated her poorly because she wasn't the truck that she was supposed to be. Instead, she was an airplane that none of them were. Sometimes when people have differences and they aren't what you want them to be or they aren't what you expect them to be, you don't treat them nicely. It's like a saying that, you know, you wouldn't judge a fish for climbing a tree poorly because that's not what a fish does. You wouldn't expect a bike to fly like an airplane. And sometimes we shouldn't expect other people to fit who we want them to be. Or sometimes we need to be gracious with ourselves and let it happen to where we grow into who we are and to really see who we are, not trying to be someone else that we're not. So when we think about the areas that Sanford Harmony showed us, we think about diversity and inclusivity, peer relationships, all those areas fit together. All those areas show us that we need to communicate with ourselves, with each other. We need to really see if we're treating other people the way we want them to be for us or the way and who they really are. So friends, I ask you, I want you to look around your friends and your family today and see if you see them as who they are in your life or you see them how they are in their lives? Kind of a tricky question, isn't it? We don't know. It's all about how we're seeing it in the situation that we're in. So that doesn't mean you don't have to want to grow and do different things, right? You can want to have, you know, maybe uh, animal feet, you know, maybe you want to run faster and you know that having different feet or climbing like a mountain goat would be really cool or trying to do better at something. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying make sure that you are allowing people to be who they are and to grow the way they're supposed to grow, right? Just like our beautiful environment here around us. It's really sunny and hot and sometimes that doesn't allow a lot of plants to grow. But for these sunflowers, it's exactly what they need. Sometimes we don't all need the same thing. Sometimes in order to be equitable, each of us needs different things. So maybe I need a little more attention. Maybe I need a little less. Maybe I need you to listen. Maybe I need to talk. You don't know. So give people a chance, give yourself a chance. Let's ask one of our questions today. It's from my chat pack for kids. If you could create the ultimate sandwich, what ingredients would you use? Doesn't have to use bread, does it? Sandwich could use lettuce or spinach. What would you use? I'm gonna give you a second to think about that as we take a deep breath, okay? Deep breath in, deep breath out. Sandwich ingredients, what makes a sandwich? Deep breath in, deep breath out. Well, I'm coming up with some of my favorite foods in the whole wide world, here we go. Deep breath in, deep breath out. All right, friends, my favorite food is tacos. 
my ultimate sandwich would resemble a taco, which to me is a sandwich. Uh, so I would use tortillas, uh, corn tortillas. Mrs. Fletcher loves corn tortillas. And, um, you know, maybe I have some langostino. I have some lobster in there. Maybe I have some carne asada. Maybe I have some pollo asada. I have some chicken or meat. Definitely some guacamole and uh, pico de gallo and, you know, some Tabasco. I'd have some kick in there, some cilantro. I'd have lots of different fun stuff. So my sandwich, my ultimate sandwich is one of my favorite foods and that's a taco. So that counts for me. <laughs> All right, friends, it is time to go. Let's go ahead and say goodbye to our friends and we will see you next time. Here we go. Adios amigos, adios amigos, adios amigos, es tiempo de decir adios. Goodbye friends, goodbye friends, goodbye friends, it's time to say goodbye. All right, so let's keep singing and keep giving yourself another chance, thinking about different ways to see other people and situations and work together to keep harmony in your life. This is Mrs. Fletcher, second grade teacher in the Osborne School District at Solano Elementary, signing off saying, I will see you later. Thanks so much for sharing and joining with me today. Bye, super friends. Hello, my name is Mrs. Davey and I am a dual language kindergarten teacher at Solano School in the Osborne District. Go Tigers! Rawr! Something interesting about me is that I've taught children from many parts of the world and many different cultures. The variety of students I have had the pleasure of teaching is one of my favorite things about being a teacher. Does your school include students from different places who now live here in the United States? Really? Wow, you know, I would love to hear more about that sometime. You know, that reminds me of our book today. It's about children from many different cultures and parts of the world, just like some of the students at my school. Today, I want to share a special book with you. It's called All Are Welcome. It was written by Alexandra Penfold and it was illustrated by Suzanne Kaufman. Look at the cover with me, will you? What do you see? Use the context clues in the illustration to help you. Yeah, me too. We see many children. Now, look more closely at the children. What's something that's the same about all of the children on the cover of our book today? Hmm, what do you notice? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, you know, give me a thumbs up if you noticed that all of the children on the cover of the book are wearing backpacks. Yeah, you used the context clues in the illustration to figure that out. You are so good at using context clues. When kids wear a backpack, where could they be going? Take some think time. You know, when I see kids wearing backpacks, it makes me think of going to school. And I wonder if these children are going to school. I guess we'll have to read to find out. Before we begin reading today, I need to share our reading strategy for the week. When we read books, we make connections. Something in the book might remind us of something in our own lives. That's called a text to self 
connection. What we're reading might remind us of another book that we've read. That is called a text to text connection. We might make connections between the book and what is happening in the world around us. And that is called a text to world connection. When I make connections, I notice that things happen in a book that are similar to me, to other books I have read, or to things happening in the world. Making connections helps me better understand the text. Today, I'm going to show you how I make connections when I read. Then you will get a chance to make a connection too. Please help me look for connections while I read. All are welcome. Written by Alexandra Penfold, illustrated by Suzanne Kaufman. Let's take a look and see what's in the book. Hmm. Oh, there's the girl from the cover and the banner says, all are welcome. All are welcome. Written by Alexandra Penfold. Illustrated by Suzanne Kaufman. Cool, the chalkboard says welcome. Pencils sharpened in their case. Bells are ringing, let's make haste. School's beginning, dreams to chase. All are welcome here. You know, I think we were correct in thinking that the kids were going to school. No matter how you start your day, what you wear when you play, or if you come from far away, all are welcome here. You know, this map reminds me of Solano School, my school. At my school, we have students and teachers from all over the world. And we had a map like this in our office. And it showed us all the different places our students and staff have come from. I just made a text to self connection. In our classroom safe and sound, fears are lost and hope is found. Raise your hand, we'll go around. All are welcome here. They look pretty happy to be in their classroom. Gather now, let's all take part. We'll play music, we'll make art. Do you see anything you like to do? Me too. We'll share stories from the heart. All are welcome here. Oh, that's my favorite thing. I love to read books. Time for lunch, what a spread. A dozen different kinds of bread. Pass it around till everyone's fed. All are welcome here. Oh, you know, this book reminds me of Say Something by Peter H. Reynolds. Do you remember Say Something? Yeah, I remember that the kids had many different signs, but we decided that the signs probably all said the same thing, didn't we? Kids from all over the world had signs that said peace in different languages. These flags remind me of those places all over the world. And we have students who are dressed in different ways and they're sharing different kinds of bread. I wonder if these students have come from all over the world. Let's turn the page and see what happens next. Open doors, rush outside. We will swing, we will slide. We'll have fun side by side. All are welcome here. We're part of a community. Our strength is our diversity. 
a shelter from adversity. All are welcome here. Have you ever seen a world map painted on a playground? Oh, wow. We will learn from each other. Special talents will uncover. There's a big world to discover. You know, I think these are their science projects. Oh, wow, look at those costumes. All are welcome here. Wow, I wonder if they study Chinese at that school. So much to learn, so much to do. And when the busy day is through, look at them. They've got their backpacks again. Can't wait to come back, start anew. All are welcome here. I think their day is done. It said when the busy day is through. Oh, yep, she's home now. Let's see what it says. Head for home to get some rest. She's taking her bath and putting on her jammies. And greet tomorrow, ready and fresh. She's getting good night kisses from her family. Hmm. Our time together is the best. Oh, they're all dreaming about their friends while they sleep. See, they're sleeping in their bed and then the clouds represent their dreams. Oh, hmm. It looks like they could be waking up. What do you think? All are welcome here. Oh boy, dad's tasting something looks delicious. Oh look, the family is leaving their house together. Yep. And it looks like their neighbors are leaving too. You have a place here. All are welcome. Wait a minute. You have a space here. Oh, they went back to their school. Oh, it looks like they're having a potluck. Do you see the table with all the food? And their science projects are out and the Chinese dancers are dancing. It's a community event. And now that the event is over, I think their families are leaving. Look at those beautiful, colorful buildings around their school. Boy, I kind of wish I lived there. And our book is finished. Let's take a minute to practice our strategy of making connections. All right, think back to your favorite part of all are welcome. Okay, I want you to close your eyes and visualize. Remember that means to make a picture up in your mind. Okay, make sure your eyes are closed. Now, in your mind, visualize that favorite part from today's book. When you've got it, I want you to open your eyes again. I'm gonna give you guys about five more seconds. All right. Now, when you think of your favorite part of All Our Welcome, I want to know why that was your favorite part. Is it because you made a connection between the book and yourself? Did it remind you of something about you? All right. Did it remind you of another book that you've read? Yeah, sometimes that makes a book my favorite when it reminds me of something else that I've already read. Did the book remind you of something going on in the world around you? All right. 
If you made a connection with the book today, you can give me a thumbs up. And if you didn't make a connection with the book today, that's okay. It just means you need more practice. Today, we heard All Are Welcome by Alexandra Penfold and Suzanne Kaufman. We learned that school can be a place where all people are welcome. We learned that no matter who you are, school is a place to come together and share our cultures. Today, we made connections with the text by noticing when something we read was similar to something about ourselves, another book, or something in the world. We used the strategy of making connections to help us understand what the author and illustrator described with their words and illustrations. Even though we can't be together in school right now, I want you to know that once it's safe to return, you will be welcome at school. Our students and teachers may need to learn through computers for a while, and that's okay. Once it's safe to go back to school, things will be different. We may need to have smaller groups of students. We may need to keep our distance from one another. We may need to wash our hands frequently. We may need to wear masks to protect ourselves and our classmates and teachers. Okay. Even though things will be different at school, please remember that you will be welcome there. I know your teachers will be excited to see you. Until then, I hope you will notice what is the same about people in your world. Please remember how important you are to the world. You're important to me. You are important to your teachers. You are important to your families and your community. You are important. I wish you well. Good morning, students. I'm Michael Roberts, superintendent of the Osborne School District in Central Phoenix. And I'm Quentin Boyd, superintendent of the Roosevelt School District in South Phoenix. We're pleased to have this partnership with the City of Phoenix to take Phoenix students on a new learning adventure right here on Phoenix TV. Just because our school buildings are closed doesn't mean the learning stops. We have the best, most creative teachers from Roosevelt and Osborne School Districts on board to provide you with a great learning experience. Okay, students, that's the bell. So the Phoenix TV study hall resumes. Here's your next lesson. Hi, good morning. I'm Maestra Aguirre. I am a teacher at Encanto School and the Osborne School District. Today we're going to be reading a story about Diego Rivera. He is a famous artist. One of my favorite artists is Frida. She drew a lot of pictures about herself. She painted herself and I really love her art. Hi everyone, my name is Mrs. Herskovici and I also teach at Encanto Elementary School. I teach first graders in the Osborne School District. I'm so excited for us to read the story about Diego Rivera, the artist. One of my favorite artists, his name is Degas. He drew beautiful, he drew and painted beautiful pictures of ballerinas that I like to see when I go and visit museums. Awesome. Today, we are going to be uh, reading our story and using the strategy, Fix It Up. So our objective today is I can fix my mistakes by using a strategy. And Maestra Aguirre just told us that we're gonna be using Fix It Up and it has three special parts. It has, does it look right? Does it sound right? And does it make sense? So today when Maestra Aguirre is reading, I'm going to stop her and tell her, I noticed that you made a mistake and then I'm gonna help her fix her mistakes. Before we start reading though, we're going to do a picture walk and we're going to look at the pictures and say, I notice. 
This book, Diego Rivera, His World and Ours, is by Duncan Donato. On this first page, I notice a little boy and he is drawing. There's some frogs here too. What do you notice? On those two pages, I notice that he is painting in two different locations. Wow, I notice on this page, it looks like they're by a pyramid and it looks like it was a time long ago. What do you notice? I notice that it looks like he's painting a really big piece of art and it looks so big that I think he's using a ladder to help him get to the tall parts. On this next page, I notice lots of people, some carrying children and food, some fighting. What do you notice? I notice, I think it's a celebration. I see dancing and I see a maypole and it looks like everyone's really happy on these two pages. Wow, I notice on this page, there are people and children playing like we do today. They have robots and technology, scooters, here she's talking on her phone and someone has uh, a paper airplane and they're flying an airplane with a remote control. What do you notice? I notice a busy street. I see a subway. I see people walking across the crosswalk. I see a bus and a car and I see some big city buildings. I wonder they're probably in a city because those kind of look like things that I see in Phoenix. I noticed that this picture is not in the city. It's completely different. I see pyramids in the background, a big lake and mountains. What do you notice? Well, I notice students working on computers. Maybe they're in the library. And I also notice some workers on the other page. On this page, I notice some girls. Maybe they're at the store or at a mall. And then here is a beautiful piece of art in this frame. What do you notice? I notice the luchadores. There they are wrestling and fighting. So silly. On this page, I see people fighting and they're wearing masks as well, but they look very different. They're on horses. What do you notice? I notice some different pictures, maybe an alien on a different planet. And on the other page, I noticed that maybe, is that a serpent that's flying? Hmm. On this page, I noticed people gathered together, reading and talking. On this page, I see people working together to make art. They have paint brushes. And here at the end of our story, I see that there's a glossary of words. There's a bibliography. And here is a real picture of one of Diego Rivera's murals. I know that this is a nonfiction story because it has nonfiction text features like photographs and our bibliography and glossary. This tells me that this is a book about a real person and gives me real information and facts about Diego Rivera. So now we're going to go back and we're going to read the story. 
And if I make a mistake, my friend Mr. Herskovici is going to stop me and fix my mistake. Because even grown-ups, even teachers, we all make mistakes when we read. But good readers fix it up. We fix our mistakes. Are you ready? I'm ready. Diego Rivera was born in Mexico in a city called Guanajuato, which means land of frogs. As a boy, Diego enjoyed playing with his trains, but more than anything, he liked to draw. Diego loved drawing so much that when he was a young man, he sailed on a ship across the ocean. He went to the city of Madrid in Spain to study art under the direction of a well-known painter. There he learned the classical way to paint, which means his finished paintings look very realistic, almost like photographs. After his studies, Diego went to Paris, the capital of France. There he met young arts who were paint in new and exciting ways. Wait a minute, Maestra Aguirre. That doesn't look right. I was watching you read those words and instead of saying artists and painting, you said, there he met young arts who were paint in new and exciting ways. That doesn't look right to me. Can you add this to our tree map? Oh yeah, you're right. I did make a mistake. It doesn't look right. But I can help you, Maestra Aguirre. I have a great reading strategy for you. I think that you should go back and read it again. Awesome, I will definitely try that. I'm going to go back, fix it up by reading it again. There, he met young artists who were painting in new and exciting ways. That was much better. I noticed that you used your reading strategy. Go back and read it again. Awesome, I'll definitely use that again when I read other texts and I make a mistake. He experimented with these new methods of painting himself. One method was called cubism, in which the painting did not exactly resemble the subject, but was composed of geometric shapes, such as circles, oh, squares, circles, and triangles. I went back and read it again. One day, a politician named Jose Vasconcillos urged Diego to return to Mexico. He wanted Diego and other artists to paint murals around the city about the Mexican people's history and customs. Diego was thrilled by this new project. When he returned to his homeland, Diego traveled through its deserts, mountains, and jungles. He wanted to be inspired by his country. He met people who worked the land and he visited the ruins of ancient Mexican civilizations, like those of the Aztecs and the Maya. Diego was full of ideas after his trips. With the help of his friends and apprentices, he began to paint murals on large walls so that everyone in his country, rich and poor, young and old, could see and learn from them. In his murals, Diego combined the classical way of painting he had learned as a young man and the new styles of art he had experimented with abroad. But he merged them with the simple yet elegant forms of ancient Mexican art that he had grown passionate for after his travels. On the walls of an important government building, Diego painted the history of his country. He painted the struggle of the Mexican people to break free from the Spanish king. He also painted the fight that took place many themselves against greedy men who were taking advantage of them. Wait a minute, Maestra Aguirre. I don't think that sounded right. I noticed that when you were reading, you accidentally skipped this entire part of your sentence. Whoopsies. Instead, you said he also painted the fight that took place themselves and skipped all those words in the middle. 
Can you add this mistake to our tree map so I can help you fix it? Now, Maestra Aguirre, to help you with this mistake, I have two reading strategies for you. You can look at the picture to see if that helps you make it sound right, or you can use your finger to go back and touch every word. Which one do you think Maestra Aguirre should use? Or, did you point to use your finger? What do you think Maestra Aguirre, which one should you use? Well, if I look at the picture, it doesn't really help me to fix up my mistake. So I think I should use my finger since I skipped a line. You're right, Maestra Aguirre. This would be the right strategy to help you if you accidentally skip words. Thanks for helping us solve that problem, friends. All right, I'm going to make it sound right by using my finger to fix up my mistake. He also painted the fight that took place many years later when farmers and workers defended themselves against greedy men who were taking advantage of them. That made more sense now. That was a really great strategy you used. I noticed you used your pointer finger the entire time. Great job, Maestra Aguirre. I'm definitely using that strategy when I make a mistake. Diego painted his country's dances and traditions, such as La Sandunga, a love dance from the coastal area, and the dance of Los Listones, a ribbon dance from the South. He wanted to celebrate the things that were special to Mexico and wanted Mexicans from all distant parts of the land to learn about their culture and feel proud. Diego lived to be an old man by the time he passed away, he had created many wonderful artworks and was celebrated by people in Mexico as well as around the world. But if he were alive today, what would he paint? Would he paint the way we dress and live? Would he paint the way we play? Would he paint the big Maestra mm. Aguirre, I don't think that makes sense. I heard you say, would he paint the big kitty? That definitely doesn't make sense. I wonder what strategy do you think you should use to help you fix your mistake? Hmm. Well, you had mentioned looking at the picture, so Maybe that's a strategy I could use this time. I think so. Would you mind adding that to the tree map for me? And the lucky you, your last strategy, look at the picture, is probably going to help you a lot when you go back and fix your mistake. So I'm looking at the picture. And I remember in our picture walk, that you had said that you noticed that they were in a city and that would make sense. And I remember that the letter C has two sounds to it. It can say K and it can say S like an S. So let me try that. He would paint the big city. Yeah, now that makes sense. as he painted the ancient Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. Or would he paint students at their desks, just as he painted factory workers in the production line? Maybe Diego would paint shops at the mall as he painted street vendors selling flores. 
Or would he paint the luchadores wrestling in their costumes? Just as he painted the Aztec warriors fighting the invading soldiers, the Spanish conquistadores. Would Diego paint our craze for monsters and creatures from outer space as he painted the god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent? Diego's murals teach us about the past, but they also show a better future for common people. Diego imagined everyone, men and women, boys and girls of all ages and nationalities living together and caring for one another. Today, Diego is not around to make this happen. So it is up to us to make our own murals and bring them to life. The end. And so now that we read this book, we fixed up our mistakes. We want you to think, what do you think Diego would paint today? Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question, Maestro Aguirre. And I know that when I finish reading a story, I like to use a helper sentence to help me remember what I need to answer. So today's helper sentence is, I think Diego would, would paint mm. So I have to fill out that last part. So first I'm gonna think about that question. What would Diego paint today? I have a big idea, so I'm gonna whisper my sentence to my fingers so I can get it ready to share it to my friend Maestra Aguirre. I think Diego would paint teachers helping their students. Maestra Aguirre, I'm ready for my sentence. Can I share it with you? I think Diego would paint teachers helping their students. What do you think Diego would paint today, Maestra Aguirre? Hmm. I think Diego would paint all of our community helpers working together. Nurses and janitors and doctors and grocery store workers, all helping make their community better and stronger. What do you think Diego would paint today? Think about it first. Hmm. Get those fingers ready and tell your sentence to your fingers before you say it out loud. Go ahead and do it. I think Diego would paint. Did you get it ready? Can you whisper it to somebody at your house? Thanks for sharing your sentence. I bet he probably would paint something like that today. Maestra Aguirre, I think we should look at our objective to see if we did all the things we needed to do today. Did we fix up our mistakes by using a reading strategy today? We did, we used fix it up. We used, does it look right? Does it sound right? And does it make sense to stop when we made a mistake? And you helped me use some strategies. I love using these strategies in my first grade classroom. We love going back and reading it again. We also really love to use our fingers and touch every word. And also a great reading strategy that we use is looking at the picture. All three of those strategies will help me answer those three questions. Does it look right? Does it sound right? And does it make sense? Thank you guys for reading with us today. We appreciate all of you being with us here. Know that your teachers love you and miss you very, very much. Keep reading at home and use these strategies to fix up your mistakes. Take care, we'll see you next time. We wish you well. Hello scholars. My name is Michelle Lampkin. I'm a teacher with the Roosevelt School District. I teach at John F. Kennedy Elementary, fourth grade. And today, our new strategy that we're going to work on is fix up. The fix up strategy is used by all good readers. And it's a lot of different strategies that help you comprehend the text that you're reading. So we're going to talk a little bit about 
how to use some of the fix-up strategies if you have a whole story that you need to work on fixing up or if you have just a word within the story that you need to work on just fixing up. If it is a whole story, you need to maybe back up and reread what you just read to make sure that you comprehend the story. Also, you may have to do some cross-checking. Does it make sense? Does it seem right? You may also need to retell or maybe review the story to make sure that you comprehend what's happening. Also, one of the strategies is adjust your reading rate. If you read too fast, you may miss something. So slow down and go back and reread. Another strategy is use text features. If you're reading informational text, use the text features. There may be a heading, there may be a graphic. Use the text features to help you comprehend the text better. Also, look for the main idea. Think about what that article or what that text is mostly about. See if you can figure it out. Then if you can, see if you can find at least three details that support your thinking of what the main idea is. And last but not least, stop and think as you read. Think about what is the problem, think about the events to help solve the problem, and think about the problem as it got solved. Think about if there's another solution to a problem. So that's one way that you can use the fix-up strategies to comprehend a whole text. If you are looking for just a word, the first thing you want to do is sound out words that you don't know. And let me tell you, Using the best strategy is the best strategy for sounding out words. The B stands for break apart. The E stands for examine. The S stands for say it. See if you can say it correctly. And the T is think. Does it make sense when I use that word in the sentence? If you use the best strategy for sounding out words, I think you can figure it out. Next, you want to look at word stems like prefixes or look for smaller chunks of words within a big word. Also, use your context clues to see if you can figure out what the word means. So you may have to, when you come to a word, stop and maybe read past it and go back and see if you can figure out what that word is or what it means. Also, Replace the word with a word that means the same thing. So if you read a sentence that says, the kite was enormous, maybe enormous means hmm, small. But when you look at your picture and the kite is really big, maybe if you say, oh, the kite is big, you can replace the word and it makes sense. Also, if you come to a word that you don't know, skip the word and read completely to the end of the sentence. Once you've done that, go back and later try that word again and see if you can see and see if it makes sense. Last but not least, if you can't figure it out, use a dictionary. Dictionaries are our friends. They can help us say the word. They can tell us what part of speech the word is, and they can also tell us what the word means. So that's our strategy that we're going to use this time. And our story that we're going to use that with is how I spent my summer vacation. Our read aloud today is How I Spent My Summer Vacation by Mark Teague. How I Spent My Summer Vacation by Wallace Bleff. When summer began, I headed out west. My parents told me I needed a rest. Your imagination, they said, is getting too wild. It will do you some good to relax for a while. Using the fix-up strategy, what is the main ideal of the text? So they put me on board a westbound train When summer began, I headed out west. My parents told me I needed a rest. Your imagination, they said, is getting too wild. 
It will do you some good to relax for a while. So they put me on a westbound train. To visit Aunt Firm in her house on the plains. But I was captured by cowboys, a wild looking crowd. Their manners were rough and their voices were loud. I'm trying to get to my aunt's house, I said, but they carried me off to their cowboy camp instead. The cattle boss growled as he told me to sit. We need a new cowboy, our old cowboy quit. We sure could use your help, so what do you say? I thought to myself, then said, Okay. Then I wrote my aunt firm so she'd know where I'd gone. I said not to worry. I won't be long. Dear Aunt Fern, captured by cowboys, don't worry. See you soon. Love, Wallace. That night I was given a new set of clothes. Soon I looked like a wrangler from my head to my toes. But there's more to a cowboy than boots and a hat. I found out the next day and the day after that. Hmm. Wrangler. I wonder what that word means. Wrangler. Well, if I look at my picture, they're in cowboy outfits. So I think a wrangler is someone who takes care of horses. Each day I discovered some new cowboy tricks, from roping and riding and making fire with sticks. After looking at some pictures, I need to clarify Wrangler. They take care of cows too. Slowly the word spread all over the land. That Wrangler Kid Bluff is a first-rate cow hand. Hmm, and we figured out what Wrangler meant, but I wonder what a cow hand is. Hmm. A Wrangler is someone who rides horses and takes care of cows. So I think a cow hand is someone who also takes care of cows. The day finally came when the roundup was through. Aunt Fern called, come on over, bring your cowboys with you. She was cooking a barbecue that very same day, so we cleaned up a little and we headed her way. The food was delicious, there was plenty to eat, and the band that was playing just couldn't be beat. But suddenly I noticed a terrible sight. The cattle were stirring and stamping with fright. It's a scene I'll remember to my very last day. They're gonna stampede, I heard somebody say. Hmm, stampede. Stampede. Well, the sentence before that says the cattle were stirring and stamping with fright. So maybe the cattle were scared. Just then they came charging, they charged right at me. I looked for a hiding place, a rock, or a tree. I think we were right about the word stampede because if you look, they're scared and they're running all toward Wallace. What I found was a tablecloth spread out on the ground. So I turned like a matador and spun it around. It was a new kind of cowboy 
a frantic display, the cattle were frightened and stampeded away. Hmm. He turned like a matador. I wonder what a matador is. Well, I think a matador is somebody who uses a cape, a red cape in particular, to direct the cows to where to go. I once read a book about a matador who used his red cape to distract the cows. Then the cowboys all cheered, bluffs a true buckaroo. They shook my hand and slapped my back, and Aunt Fern hugged me too. Hmm. I wonder what a buckaroo is. Well, I think a buckaroo is another word for cowboy, because he did wrangle the bulls. And that's how I spent my summer vacation. And I can hardly wait for show and tell. Scholars, I hope you enjoyed that book. Now let's review the fix-up strategies. If you are using the fix-up strategies for a whole book, which we did that, we backed up and we read some parts and we discussed some of the vocabulary. We also adjusted our reading rate. So that we read slower so that we could understand and comprehend what was happening in the book the event also we asked what is the main idea and we had to think about what the story was mostly about and come up with the main idea while we were looking for the main idea hopefully you look for three details which help with the main idea so the main ideal of our story was someone's summer vacation, and the silly, wacky events that happened during the vacation, which made the story way more enjoyable. The three details that we have to support our main idea is, Wallace said that his parents said he needed a break and he needed a rest. So, we know that it's summer. We also know that he's going to go visit Aunt Fern, Aunt Fern lives out west. That's an indication that he's going on a trip for his summer vacation. We also use strategies for just fixing up words if we couldn't figure out the word. We sounded it out using the best strategy. We also used some words in context where we had to figure out what the word meant as we read on. For instance, the word stampede. We had to think about what the sentence before stampede said and then we had to sound out the word, make sure we knew what the word stampede meant, and then we used it in a sentence. The example we used was, the cattle were stirring and stamping with fright. Stamping means that they're stepping quickly, and because they're frightened, figured if they step quickly, it would evolve into a run. Another example of a fix-up strategy is to clarify words in context. We weren't real sure what the word matador meant, but looking at the picture and looking at the bulls, I remembered a story I read about a matador who swung his red cape to control bulls, and so that's what Wallace did with the red cape. Another example of a strategy we used is to use a dictionary. The word buckaroo was very unfamiliar to me, so I used a dictionary to look it up. The word buckaroo means cowboy or bronco buster. Well, Wallace was kidnapped by a group of cowboys, and he became a cowboy himself, and he wrangled bulls. Pretty neat book. Hi friends, my name is Sochi and I'm a first grade teacher at Encanto Elementary. So I'm happy to be with you today. Today we're going to be making our own reading bookmark. And basically what I'm going to teach you is how that a bookmark can make you a better reader and some other reading tips. 
So for this activity, you're going to need some paper and some scissors. So it's super easy. You're going to cut, step one is that you're going to cut your paper into a rectangle. Just like that. It's your bookmark. Now, this strategy works because it makes a little window for your words, so you can focus on one word at a time. So this is better for kindergarten and first grade. So now I'm gonna cut out my little, little window. You wanna do a small cut, you don't want it to be too long. So I just did a little one. And then you're gonna go right below and make another little cut. And if it comes out too big, you can always just try again. And then now we have our two cuts. We're gonna kind of push it out of the way. We're just gonna cut it, cut those right off. Just like this. You just wanna cut a little window into your paper. Like that. So now that I have my little window, we can test it out and read a word. So now we're ready to test out our little bookmark. I chose the book, My Dog Buddy, which is uh, my son's favorite book. He's in kindergarten and he's learning how to read. So this is, was his first book he ever read. And this is a strategy that you can use with words that you can sound out. So for sight words, we can't really sound out this word, this. So we're gonna choose one that we can sound out. So this strategy works really well in Spanish because you can sound out every word in Spanish. So I teach Spanish and this works really well, but in English, you can still use it in some words. So we're gonna try sounding out this word. And the little window helps us focus on one sound at a time. But we're gonna keep it moving. Now what's the next sound? Now let's put it together. Buddy. Buddy. So it helps us to focus on one sound at a time. So this is called the ventanita. You can also just, you can also use it like this as you're reading. And some of my kids like doing that too. Or when you're more advanced, you can just use it underneath your words. If you're reading a chapter book, you can use this to mark your page. And I have some more tips for you. When you're learning how to read, I encourage you to read the same book over and over. So like my son, he's learning how to read My Dog Buddy. The first time he read this book, there were words in here that he couldn't read. After he read it many times, he learned that this word is goes. After you read the same book over and over, it helps you become familiar with the vocabulary. And it helps you learn new words. So read the same book over and over. If you get tired of it, move on to a new book. Always find books that you find that are fun, interesting, and inspire you to keep reading. Please read every day and go to the library. At the library, you can find lots of fun books. There's an online checkout that you can do and a curbside pickup. So you don't even have to go to the library. You can go and pick it up and they bring it to you out in your car or you can even walk there and have it picked up. You just have to call the number. So I encourage you, read the same book over and over to keep learning new vocabulary words, read every day, and go to the library. I hope you enjoy my tips for today. Until next time, adios. Hello, my name is Mrs. Button, and I am the reading specialist at Solano Elementary School in the Osborne School District, and I'm very excited to be here to read with you today. Um, if you've been with me for the last two weeks, you know that I love animals, and I have several animals that live here in this house with me. Uh, right now, I have two dogs and three cats, and you can see one of my cats here. Um, we call her Dolores, and she is just having a bath and getting ready to read. And then you'll see a little part of my other cat over here. Here's his his body. Um, and I will show them to you later if they stick around while we're reading. 
I am very excited to continue reading from this book. It is called, can you see that? There you go. It is called Out of My Mind, and the author is Sharon M. Draper. This is a very good book. It's a book about a young girl named Melody, and Melody has a condition called cerebral palsy. And because of her condition, she is nonverbal, so she does not speak. And she is also in a wheelchair and has limited movement of her body. So, so far we've read a little bit about Melody and we've learned that she's very intelligent. Melody is very, very smart, but she's not able to verbalize or speak her thoughts. So sometimes it's frustrating for her because she has these thoughts and feelings that she knows and she understands information, but she's not able to let the people around her know that she knows. So our strategy today, we're going to be working on connections. And you make connections all the time. When you meet new people, you're making connections. Um, when I started today and I was telling you about my pets, you were making a connection. You were thinking, oh, I love pets too, or oh, I have a cat, or oh, I have a dog. Or maybe you were thinking, I don't like cats very much. And so you and I were kind of connecting in that way. You were connecting to me. Either you saw something that we had in common or you saw something that was maybe a difference for us. When you're reading, you're making connections with the text. You're making connections in several different ways. The one that we're going to focus on today is the text to self connection. So as I'm reading, you should be thinking about how does that relate to me? Or what do I know that's similar to that? Or what have I done that's similar to that? or different. You also make connections based on differences. You're able to kind of understand things, um, maybe because you don't agree with it. You, you understand it a little differently. So I'm going to show you what this means as we're reading, but I'm just going to get started right here. When I was eight, things changed. I think I knew mom was going to have a baby even before she did. She smelled different, like new soap. Her skin felt softer and warmer. So already right there, I can make a connection to that because my mom um, had my brother when I was four. So I know what it's like to have a younger sibling. So I'm already able to connect right there to Melody. I know what she's going through, finding out that her mom is going to have a baby. She picked me up out of bed one morning, then almost let me fall back on the mattress. Whew, she said, you're getting awfully heavy, Melody. I'm going to have to start lifting weights. Her forehead had broken out in a sweat. I don't think I'd gained any weight. It was mom who was different. She sat down on the chair next to my bed for a few minutes, then suddenly ran out of the room. I heard her throwing up in the bathroom. She came back a few minutes later looking pale. Her breath smelled like mouthwash. I must have eaten something funky, she mumbled as she got me dressed. But I think she knew even then. I bet she was scared. When Melody finally figured... Sorry, when mom finally figured it out, she sat down with me to break the news. Melody, I have something wonderful to tell you. I did my best to look curious. You're going to have a baby brother or sister real soon. I grinned and did my best imitation of surprise and excitement. I reached out and hugged her. Then I patted her stomach and pointed to myself. She knew what I meant. She looked me right in the eye. We're going to pray this little one is fat and fine and healthy. She told me, you know we love you, Melody, just as you are. But we're hoping this child doesn't have to face the same challenges that you do. Me too. From then on, she put Dad in charge of lifting me, and although she never talked about it again in front of me, I knew she was worried. She gobbled gigantic green vitamin pills, ate lots of fresh oranges and apples, and she had this habit of touching her bulging belly and mumbling a prayer. I could tell that Dad was scared, too, but his worry showed up in funny little ways, like bringing Mom piles of purple irises, her favorite flower, or fixing her gallons of grape Kool-Aid or big plates of grapes. I didn't know what made mom crave the purple stuff. Instead of watching hours and hours on the, of the Discovery Channel, I found myself in my room staring at an empty TV screen. Oh, my cats are hissing. I'm sorry. Come over here. 
we're all fine. We're just reading. You need to sit down. Okay. I'm sorry. I lost my place. Okay. Uh, here we are. Instead of watching hours and hours of the Discovery Channel, I found myself in my room staring at an empty TV screen, just thinking in silence. So this is where I'd like you to try to make a connection to Melody. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been just lost in thought and, and maybe just kind of staring off into space, just huh, thinking about things? I know I have, so I can definitely connect. I know what that feels like. I know um, why I've needed to do that um, sometimes. So I can connect to her there. I knew that the baby was really, I knew that a new baby was really time consuming. And I also knew I took up a lot of time. How would my parents ever have time for both of us? Then a really horrible thought popped into my brain. What if they decided to look into Dr. Hugely's suggestions? So in one of the previous chapters that we didn't read together, Melody is taken to a doctor and the doctor recommends to her mom that she look into placing Melody in a care facility um, because her the doctor says maybe that her parents can't really take care of her as well as if she were in a, a facility. So she's saying here, what if, what if there, what if, sorry, what if they decided to look into Dr. Hugely's suggestions? I couldn't make the thought go away. One Saturday afternoon, a few months before the baby was born, I was curled up on our sofa dozing. Mom had put pillows around me to make sure I didn't fall off. Butterscotch slept nearby. Butterscotch is her dog. And dad's favorite jazz station played a saxophone snoozer. Mom and dad sat together on the smaller sofa talking quietly. I'm sure they thought I was asleep. So can you connect to that? Have you ever overheard a conversation when people maybe thought you weren't there or people thought you were asleep? What if? Mom said, her voice tight. It won't be. The chances are so small, honey, Dad replied, but he sounded unsure. I couldn't bear it, Mom told him. You'll find the strength, he said calmly, but it's not going to happen. The odds are. But what if? She insisted, interrupting him, and for only the second time I could remember, my mother started to cry. Everything is going to be fine, my father said, trying to soothe her. We've got to think positive thoughts. It's all because of me, my mother said softly. I perked up and listened harder. What do you mean? Dad asked. It's my fault that Melody is like she is. Mom was crying really hard then. I could hardly make out her words. Diane, that's crazy. You can't hold on to that kind of guilt. These things just happen. I could tell Dad was trying to be reasonable. No, I'm the mother, she wailed. It was my job to bring a child into the word world safely, and I messed it up. Every other woman on the planet is able to give birth to a normal baby. There must be something wrong with me. Sweetheart, it's not your fault. It's not your fault and I could hear him pull my mom to him. But Chuck, I'm so scared this baby is going to be messed up too, she said in a shuddering breath. Please don't go there. Don't even think like that, Dad murmured. Statistically, what are the chances? Two children who... And I suddenly couldn't hear him anymore because my head was pulsing with the things I wanted to say, but couldn't. I wanted to tell mom that I was sorry she was so sad and so scared. It wasn't, that it wasn't her fault, that I was just the way I was and she had nothing to do with it. The part that hurt the most is I couldn't tell her any of it. During mom's entire pregnancy, however, my parents' attention to me never wavered, even though, yeah, I worried that it would. Dad did lots more as mom got closer to her due date. He did some of the laundry, most of the cooking, and all the lifting and carrying. I got to go to school on time. I got to school on time every day, got my stories read to me every night, and the three of us waited and hoped and prayed. But Penny was born perfect and copper bright, just like her name. From the minute she came home from the hospital, she was a really happy baby. Mom truly did carry a little bundle of joy into the house. But I guess a new baby is rough on any parents, especially if they already have a kid like me at home. 
Sometimes there would be arguments. I could hear them through the bedroom wall. I need more help around here, Chuck, Mom would say, trying to keep her voice low. Well, you pay more attention to the baby than you do to me. If you'd help more, I'd have more time for you. With two kids and one of them, Melody, it's not easy. I have to go to work, you know. I have a job, too. Don't throw that in my face. Plus, I'm up twice a night to nurse the baby. I know, I know. I'm sorry, Diane. Dad always softened and let Mom win. It's just, I'm so tired all the time, Mom would say, her voice muffled. I'm sorry. I'll do better, I promise. I'll take off work tomorrow and take care of both girls. Why don't you go catch a movie or take Mrs. Valencia out to lunch? It would get quiet once more, but even so, somehow, I always ended up feeling a teeny bit guilty. Life sure would be easier if they only had one child, one with working parts. So I want to pause there and ask if you can make a connection to that scene in the book. Have you ever um, overheard an argument or done something that you thought caused an argument and felt guilty? Yeah, so the, the text says that she felt a tiny bit guilty. Melody, Melody felt a tiny bit guilty. She hasn't done anything wrong, but she's feeling a little guilty. So I know that I have overheard an argument and, and felt like the argument was happening because of me. And I know what that feels like. So I'm able to relate to Melody because I, I have experienced that. I can connect to that. I once got one of those electronic dolls for Christmas. It was supposed to talk and cry and move its arms and legs if you pushed the right buttons. But when we opened the box, one of the arms had come off and all the doll did, no matter what button you pushed, was squeak. Mom took it back to the store and got her money back. I wonder if she ever wished she could get a refund for me. But Penny, Penny really was a perfect baby. After just a few months, she was sleeping through the night and smiling through each day. She sat up exactly when infants are supposed to, rolled over right on schedule and crawled on cue. Amazing. And it seemed so easy. Sure, she fell on her face a few times, but once she got it, she was off. Petty zoomed around like a little wind-up toy. She learned that the toilet was fun to splash in and that lamps would fall if you grabbed the cord. She learned that golden retrievers are not ponies, peas taste funny, dead flies on the floor are a no-no, but candy is really good. She laughed all the time. She learned her sister, Melody, couldn't do what she could do, but she didn't seem to care, so I tried not to care either. Dad and his video camera followed Penny around like the paparazzi follow a rock star. We have hundreds of hours of footage of Penny being cute and doing adorable things. And, well, I admit it, sometimes I got kind of sick watching a new video every time she learned something new. It sort of stinks to watch a baby do what you wish you could do. So can you connect to that in a way? And what I mean by that is... Do you have a sibling or a cousin or maybe someone um, that's part of your family or that lives with you and they're able to do something that you are not able to do? Maybe not even someone who lives with you, but a friend. Do you know someone who's able to do something that you wish you could but you can't? And how does that feel? Penny holding her own bottle. Penny feeding herself teeny tiny Cheerios from her high chair tray. Penny saying, Mama and Dada, just like the babies on Sesame Street. Penny crawling on the floor and chasing butterscotch. Penny clapping her hands. How did her little brain know how to tell her to pull herself up to a standing position, to hold on to the sofa for balance? How did she know how to stand on her own? Sometimes she'd fall over, but then she'd pop right back up. Never, ever did she lie there, stuck like a turtle on its shell. Dad still did our nighttime reading, but now it was Penny who snuggled on his lap. I was too big and too hard to balance. So I sat in my wheelchair, my dog at my feet, as the two of them read the stories I knew by heart. Butterscotch still slept only in my room. I liked that. It really did make me glad to know Penny was learning the same books I loved so much. I wondered if she was memorizing them. Probably not. She didn't need to. I think Penny's third word was Dee Dee. She couldn't quite say Melody, but she got the last part. I loved it when Mom put Penny in bed with me after her morning bath. 
She'd grab me and plant wet baby powder smelling kisses all over my face. Dee Dee, she'd say again and again. By the time she was one year old, Penny could walk. She wobbled all over the house on her fat little legs. She fell a lot, dropping down on her butt and laughing every time she did. Then she'd get back up and try again. That was something I'd never get to try. With two kids in the house, our family routines changed. It took twice as long to get everyone ready in the morning. Mom made sure Penny was dressed in pretty little outfits every day, even though she was just going next door to Mrs. V's house. My clothes were okay, but I was noticing that lately they were more useful than cute. Mom seemed to be choosing them by how easy they'd be to get on me. It was kind of a bummer, but I knew I was getting heavier and heavier to lift, and so changing me was harder. I probably should mention that feeding me is a real process. I can't chew very well, so I mostly get soft foods like scrambled eggs or oatmeal or applesauce. Since I can't hold a fork or spoon, I try, but I keep dropping them. Someone has to place the food in my mouth, one spoonful at a time. It's slow. Spoon, slurp, swallow, spoon, slurp, swallow. Lots of food falls on the floor. Butterscotch likes that. She's like a canine vacuum cleaner. So are you able to connect to that visual? I know I am, and I've got that picture in my mind, and I can connect to that because I have dogs, and, and when we drop food on the floor, boy, my, my dogs are right there cleaning up. Drinking stuff is hard for me, too. I can't hold a glass, and I can't sip from a straw, so somebody has to very carefully hold a cup to my lips and tip a little bit of liquid into my mouth so I can swallow. Too much, and I choke and cough, and we have to start all over. It takes a long time to get a meal in me. I hate the whole process, obviously. And some mornings were really stressful. Chuck, can you bring me Melody's pink t-shirt from the clean clothes bas basket? She spilled juice all over her shirt, Mom yelled up the stairs. Didn't you put a bib on her, Diane? Dad yelled back. You know she makes a mess. Why don't you wait and dress her after she eats? So you want me to feed her naked? Just bring a shirt, Mom snapped. And a diaper for Penny. She's got a stinker. She's two. Isn't she old enough to be potty trained? Dad asked, coming downstairs with a blue t-shirt I had outgrown in one hand and a diaper in the other. Right. I'll get on potty training tonight on the 25th hour of my day. Dad picked Penny up. Uh-oh. That's a bad one, he said, his nose scrunched up. Did you give her sweet potatoes again last night? Well, if you had gone to the grocery store like I asked, I could have given her something different. And that shirt is blue, not pink, and too small for Melody. Mom stormed out of the kitchen and up the stairs. Sorry, girls, Dad said to us. He whistled softly while he cleaned Penny up, threatening to call the hazmat team. That was funny. When he finished feeding me breakfast, not caring that my oatmeal was getting all over the juice, sorry, then he finished feeding me breakfast, not caring that my oatmeal was getting all over the ju my juice-stained shirt. Why not? May as well make a real mess and make it worth all the stress, he said with a laugh. I smiled at him and smeared oatmeal on my tray. Mom came back down with fresh makeup and a freshly painted on smile, her hair done, and with my pink shirt, she and Dad hugged in the kitchen, both took a deep breath, whew, and we actually made it out of the house on time. We had a lot of days like that. So can you connect to that? Have you ever had a hectic morning where you're trying to get out on time and, and maybe others in the house or you are running behind and it's just very chaotic and then all of a sudden it's like, whew, okay, we made it. I can connect to that. I've definitely had mornings like that. So it's been really great to read with you today. We've been reading this book here. Again, it is called out of my mind by Sharon Draper and I would encourage you to try to get your hands on this book so that you can read it either get it from the library or if you're able to um, purchase it it's a really great book Sharon Draper is a wonderful author for books for students in grades about grades four through eight she has many different books including some series um, so I highly recommend checking out Sharon Draper I have enjoyed reading with you very much, and so has this guy. He's been here sleeping and, and reading with us the whole time we've been reading. So please continue to read and stay well, and I'll see you soon. Good morning. 
I am so happy to have you here today for our read aloud. Welcome to the class. I am Dr. Saunders from Cesar Chavez Leadership Academy in the Roosevelt School District, where I teach junior high language arts. First, before we begin, let's take a look at a video about cliques in middle school, which is the subject of today's story. Hi, it's Maya. In this vlog, I want to talk about cliques and how to navigate them. There's always been cliques at my school. The popular kids, the girly girls, the sporty boys, the geeks. But the worst part about it is that you're either in or out. What's weird is that I think cliques start with good intentions. The way to fit in, for kids to connect with other kids with the same interests. But here's where the solution starts to break down. When you include someone, you automatically exclude others. Also, how much do you influence the identity of the group? And how much does the group influence your identity? I just started seventh grade last week, and I'm starting to figure out that I don't neatly fit into any one group. I'm sporty and artsy and nerdy and sort of emo. It's like diversion when four says Tris. I don't want to just be one thing. I want to be brave. I want to be selfless, intelligent, and honest, and kind. What? Mind blow. I think it can be amazing to find a close group of friends with deep friendships and connections are some of the best times in life. I also think it's important to embrace all the different parts of yourself and to find people that support you no matter how nerdy or emo you get. Please check us out at akamoti.com where we unlock the ancient power of kind. And don't forget to subscribe to, share, and comment on our vlogs. Today's book, as you may know, is about clicks, and it's entitled Clicks, Phonies, and Other Balonies by Trevor Roman and Elizabeth Verdick, illustrated by Steve Mark. Our strategy today is about making connections. Something in the book may remind us of something in our lives. When we're reading, it may remind us of another book we've read or we may make connections to what's happening in the world around us. Today, I'm gonna to show you how I make connections as I read. Doing this helps me interpret and really get into the text. I become a part of the text as I see how things that happen to a character could happen to me too. Let's begin. Why do you need this book? No baloney. Click. It's a word that's spelled, that's spelled funny and sounds funny and like a vampire can be a pain in the neck. The word click sounds like trick. It's tricky being clicky as you go through school. Here's one definition, click, noun, narrow exclusive group of people, especially one held together by common interests and views. Exclusive means having the power to exclude certain people or keep them out. So clicks, it's like slamming the door on others, bang. Clicks can make you feel shut out, scared, lonely, worried, angry, unwelcome, unhappy, unpopular, pressured. Any of those feelings make it harder for you to have fun, pay attention in school, or be confident about who you are. If you're bothered by clicks, this book is for you. If you're dying to be in a click, this book is for you too. Even if you're in a click, you can learn something from this book. This book is about what clicks are and what they do and what they can do, what you can do about them. It's also about making friends, those important people in your life who don't mind if you act goofy or make mistakes. You'll learn that having good friends isn't always the same thing as being popular or being in a click. 
You'll also discover that the best way to get along with people at school or anywhere else is to be friendly and respectful. Best of all, you'll see that being yourself, not someone else, can help you grow up with greater confidence. So I'm gonna pause here because this is a part of the story. It reminds me about me when I was in elementary school and middle school. I was a smart kid. And as a result, I frequently was picked on by the other students because I was a smart kid. And I was left out, not invited to parties. And I felt like I was shut out and lonely and unwelcome and unpopular. But lucky for me, I had some great friends as well who helped me and hung out with me and made me feel like I was okay. And so it's important to have people who around you who appreciate who you are. Are you sick of clicks? Does a click at your school leave you feeling annoyed, uneasy, or a little queasy? If clicks make you sick, you might have click vomititis, otherwise known as the click sickness. Maybe you feel like throwing up because a click is being clicky. This means click members are leaving out other kids on purpose, act like they're better than everyone else, set rules or standards about how others should just behave or be. Let's pause here. If you've read the Harry Potter books or saw the movie, you'll notice the scene where Harry comes first comes to school and the cool kids, Drapo, try to recruit Harry to join his group. But Harry made the wise decision to stay with his new friends, Hermione, Hermione of course, and Ron Weasley, as opposed to being with the kids who were leaving other kids out and acting like they were better than everyone else. It was a great decision for Harry Potter, as you find out throughout the rest of the story, by his selecting to stay with his friends rather than joining the other group. Click sickness might make you want to skip school. It's hard to get out of bed and face another day of feeling like you don't belong. But each new day is a chance to kick that sickness. It may help to look closer at what these clicks, what makes a click a click. The ins and outs of clicks. Remember that definition of a click, see page one. An important word in it is, is exclusive. A click excludes others or leaves them out. A click is different from a group of friends. You may have a few close friends you hang around with. Maybe you live near each other, participate in the same sports or club, sit by each other at lunch and share interests. Nothing's wrong with that, especially if you make room for others to join. A click has a different approach. Clicks are sticky. They stick together like glue. The members of the click are almost always together. Maybe they take up a whole lunch table or block the hallway as they walk side by side in a line. The message is, we're in, you're out. Hmm. Perhaps you've seen that in your cafeteria. There's a group of, of so-called cool kids who all sit at the same table every day for lunch. And everyone else who's not a cool kid can't sit at that particular table in the cafeteria. Experts say that some cliques behave like this to feel stronger and more powerful. Kids in the clique might feel better about themselves if they say, let's not hang out with them. Think about how wild wolves form packs in the wilderness. Cliques aren't as dangerous, but the idea is the same. They stick together because there's safety in numbers. Being clicky can make the clique seem secure because being part of a group is kind of a protection. So are others left out because the clique members are somehow better? No, people in cliques are not better or above or more. People outside of cliques are just as important as anyone inside. That's the truth. 
even if it doesn't always feel true to you. The number one click myth, kiss and click are the most confident, happy, and popular kiss of all. Some click members may be confident and feel good about themselves, but others are insecure and being part of a group makes them feel better. Kids and clicks often worry a lot about how they look, how they act, and what people think of them. People inside the group and outside it, that adds up to a lot of pressure. So click members may appear happy on the outside, but feel intense pressure on the inside. That's no fun at all. It's also a myth that kids and click are always popular. Actually, they may have trouble getting to know other classmates if they hang out with the same people all the time. The whole sticking like glue thing can get old after a while. Another click myth, clicks are easy to spot. Some click are clicky on the internet and others make them sort of invisible. The people in online clicks hide behind their computer screens and spend time putting down others on social media. With the click of a mouse, these click members gossip, spread rumors, make rude comments, or post hurtful words and images. To avoid this kind of act interaction, think carefully about what you do when you're online. Don't use social media sites without your parents' permission, and be sure to use the privacy settings available. Think hard about what you post and how you respond to others. Never share your passwords, even with your BFF. That's just part of staying safe online. Weird things clicks do. One, they always travel in a group. They go everywhere together, like a herd of cows. Why do they want to behave like an animal that spends eight hours a day chewing his cud, barfing up grass and swallowing it again? So let's pause there. If you've read the book Divergent or seen the movies, you'll see that one of the things that happen is once they've decided which, where the, what group you belong to, you're forced to stay with that group and you have to dress like that group and you do everything together with that group, even if you don't want to. And they look at you crosswise when you try to talk to people from the other group. Remember, Trish wanted to see her brother who was in another group, and she got into trouble because of that. Number two, cliques have rules. The rules say who's cool and who's not, and what members can and can't do, as we've talked about in the book The Virgin. Some of the rules are really stupid. For example, maybe kids in the clique start pressuring each other to smoke or drink alcohol. Maybe they bully others. Maybe click members make each other tell personal secrets. Maybe they laugh at each other's mistakes or call each other out for trying to make new friends. Who needs the extra rules, especially ones that make you feel bad? Number three, they have leaders. The leaders make rules that everyone has to follow, no matter how dumb those rules are. Aren't people in clicks too old for follow the leader? If you remember in the movie Clueless, Cher was the leader of the group, but then once she started changing her mind and wanting to do something different, they quickly kicked her to the curb and got a new leader for their group of girls to, to follow. Number four, they have a dress code. Most people in cliques wear the same kinds of clothes, t-shirts, jeans, jackets, and caps. They might have to wear sneakers so big they look like snow boots. Try this out. Say the word click to yourself 10 times fast. You sound like a machine or a robot. Hmm, what does that tell you? You're not a robot. You're not a cow or a sheep that has to follow the herd. You're not some cookie cutter person who has to be just like all the other snickerdoodles. You're you. You can learn not to get caught up in clicks. You can make friends and be a good friend. Keep reading to find out more. Chapter two, why do cliques exist? Some cliques act like they rule the school or the neighborhood or the mall or the basketball court or social media. Maybe they pick on certain people and treat them like dirt. Maybe they even treat you that way. Why does this happen? 
Is it because cliques are full of mean, nasty, horrible people? Not really. Is it because their main goal in life is to make you miserable? Nope. To understand cliques, you have to know why they exist. Figuring out the why can make things easier to understand. Cliques exist because everyone, no matter what their age, want to have friends. People like to feel as if they belong. That's human nature. Being part of a group helps us feel safe, secure, and positive. Strange but true. People will do the strangest things to belong or fit in. Take Trevor, for example. When Trevor was in eighth grade, he wanted to join the smoking clique in the worst way. He thought those people were cool and tough. He wanted to hang out with them. So he tried smoking once and nearly barfed. He learned that smoking cigarettes wasn't a good way to make friends. I have to pause at this and laugh because I did the exact same thing. So the cool kids used to smoke in the restrooms, in the bathrooms, and um, behind the, the, the school building at times. So I wanted to be part of the cool kids group, and I joined them once and was given a cigarette to smoke. Needless to say, it was awful. And although I did not throw up, I quickly learned that this was not my thing, and being part of that group was not something that I wanted to do. Next, he decided to jump around and act silly to get his classmates to notice him. This turned into a disaster when his pants fell down in front of a whole group of people. He realized that being a fool isn't cool either. Another way Trevor tried to make friends and fit in was to pretend his family was really rich. He told a group of schools that he lived in a mansion with an Olympic-sized heated pool because he wanted them to think he was important. Everyone was impressed until the group paid him a surprise visit. Trevor lived in a small house, and the closest thing to a swimming pool in his yard was a bird bath. He felt bad when the other kids learned the truth. He had pretended to be what he thought they wanted him to be. In the end, he realized he was just being phony. Elizabeth also had plenty of run-ins with cliques in middle school. She changed her hair, her clothes, her shoes, her music choice, her attitude, all to be like the girls in a big clique. She even changed her handwriting. It took her three times as long to write anything because of that. Not helpful during test time. Were all of these things worth it? For a couple of months, Elizabeth thought they were. Then she realized she didn't really like those girls in the clique, and she didn't like herself while part of it. And the truth was, the girls in the clique didn't want to be her friend unless she looked and acted like them. <coughs> Guess what? It felt good to go back to her old familiar handwriting and to listen to the music she loved. Did you figure out that Trevor and Elizabeth are the authors of this book? That's right. These are our experiences with Click, and they are the reason we wrote this book. Changing who you are to fit in isn't the answer to a Click problem. Learning to like yourself the way you are is important. It is called self acceptance. And we will stop right here. I hope you watched and saw what I did as I read the book. I found many places where. I was reminded of things about myself and my childhood and being and wanting to be part of a clique. And I also brought it also brought up memories of books as well as movies that were about kids and being part of cliques. I hope that you will take a moment and to think about what we read today and ask yourself a couple of questions. Are you popular with yourself? Are you being yourself? Are you kind to others? If you can answer yes to these questions, congratulations. Being a part of a clique won't matter to you. This was a story about kids belonging and not belonging to cliques. You have to make the decision that you like yourself just as you are and that it's important to be yourself than to be someone that you aren't just so some kids can like you. Remember, just be yourself. 
thanks for coming to class. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the summer. You've been watching Phoenix TV's Study Hall, brought to you by District 8 and our partners at Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts. Tune in Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. for more Study Hall. I hope you learned something today and keep up the great work.